Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, please. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We're going to read verses 21 through 25. Verses 21 through 25. John chapter 11. We'll read the verses responsibly, as we normally do. Begin together on 21 and alternating until we end together on verse 25. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 21 of John 11. Ready? Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture tonight. Thank you, Lord, for... A wonderful time together here this evening. We sure enjoyed the service this morning and the cantata by the choir and the, the, the spirit and the good service, the, the decisions that were made. And yet, Lord, we're enjoying tonight's service and our time at the Lord's table. And, Lord, the singing of the songs of God and the fellowship with God's people. Lord, thank you for the privilege to have the Bible and open it tonight and to be able to listen Uh, to your words this evening. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing on the special and make our hearts good ground that the word of God will fall into tonight and bring forth fruit in our lives. So, Lord, minister to us. Bless the solo in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the third day since he died and it was said he would arise then from the grave the lamb came forth oh I have reason to rejoice there rose a lamb in Jerusalem
appreciate Cindy Taylor doing the singing tonight. Bob is uh, struggling with uh, being under the weather and his uh, voice and such, and Nikki had to work, and Tanya has sick children, and uh, they were dropping like flies, so I'm thankful we had a healthy one to be able to sing, amen? That sure was, sure was a blessing, wasn't it? Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us, and thank you, Lord, for another opportunity we have to look into your word together. Father, we're asking now that you would help us as we Listen carefully to what the Spirit would want to say to each of us tonight. Help me as I bring the truth this evening, Lord. Help me to say what I need to say and leave unsaid what I don't need to say. But Lord, give us, give us help. Give us encouragement this evening as we look at the resurrections uh, here in the New Testament and especially here in the life of Christ. So Lord, guide us and lead us through the Scriptures. And Spirit of God, speak to hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Keep your Bible open to John 11. We're going to go there in just a few minutes. But um, the, the boss asked one of his employees if he believed in life after death. And he said, yes, sir. He said, well, then that makes everything just fine. And he kind of looked at his boss a little funny. And the boss said, well, after you left early yesterday to go to your grandmother's funeral, she stopped in to see you. Life after death, amen? Some of you get that later, but you'll, you'll get it. <laughs> Verse 25, John 11. If you look there, notice what Jesus said to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The... You know, Martha was saying, when Jesus said, your brother will rise again, Martha said, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's thinking the resurrection as an event. The resurrection as a, as a, a thing that's going to take place in the future. And Jesus said, Martha, you're misunderstanding something. The resurrection isn't an event. The resurrection is a person. And I am the resurrection and the life is what Jesus said. And, and you know, someone said the crucifixion represents the worst man can do, but Resurrection Sunday represents the best God can do. Amen? Amen. And uh, he's alive today. And, he, and, he, and, and all of us at times face the, the Calvary situation where things look black, things look dark, things look like it's all hope is gone, uh, there's nothing we can do, the situation's hopeless, uh, dreams are dashed, hopes are gone, uh, nothing's going to work. But I guarantee you, just as sure as, as there was a Calvary on what I think was Wednesday, I believe there's a resurrection coming on Sunday. Amen? Uh, three days between the worst of days and the best of days. And the difference is Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look tonight, just briefly, at three resurrections that occurred in Jesus' ministry. And I think we can relate them to three areas of life that we'll all face sometime. And we can have hope in the resurrection. Uh, in the resurrection being not an event, but a person. Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the first one. Luke chapter 8, if you would. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 8. I'm reminded as we look at these, these accounts tonight that we'll look at that there was a young preacher who was encountering his first time to have to do a funeral service and he wasn't quite sure how to handle it. Wasn't quite sure what he should do. And so he thought, well, I know that Jesus is our example. I'll just follow Jesus' example. And uh, I'll, I'll see how he conducted a funeral. And as he started to go through and study, all the time there was Jesus met somebody who was dead. He brought him back to life. And uh, he thought, well, that's not going to work. And you'll never find Jesus conducting a funeral service. Why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. And uh, he always brings life to the situation. Now, here's a, here's a situation in... Luke chapter 8, and if we uh, begin reading in verse number 41, the Bible says, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, <clears throat> and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And then you have the interruption here of the woman uh, with the issue of blood. 
and, and he takes care of that situation. And let's pick up the story with Jairus' daughter again in verse 49. Would you look there? While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, the da Thy daughter is, what church? Dead. Dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not. Believe only, she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. Now, if her spirit came again, it means it was gone. Okay? She really was dead. Okay? That's true. And, uh, but Jesus brought the spirit back, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. And he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Now, any parent would probably have a heart and try to understand here what Jairus is going through. <clears throat> Think about this now. Not just, not just a daughter, but his one and only daughter. And now she's 12 years of age, and she's dying. And uh, at the, really at the point of death. Do you think, don't, don't you think Jairus had a vision of his daughter? Don't you think he had dreams for her? Don't you think he could picture her growing up to be a young woman and, and uh, probably at her age, even at 12, they might have already had a young man picked out that they thought would be the suitable one for her, for her and uh, would, would prepare her for that wedding day. Uh, probably had visions of her being married and having children and him holding grandchildren and uh, enjoying the, the grandchildren and uh, the, 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 the dreams that he had. And, and I think as he watches her lay there and, and the, the life draining out of her body, his dreams are crumbling as well. The vision he had for her life is crumbling as well. And you know, we all have similar situations. We all have gone through similar experiences. The, it may not be necessarily a child, but it can be things that are very important to us in our life. Sometimes it may be finances. Sometimes it may be relationships with other people. Sometimes it may be uh, our job security. And of course, it could always be our children as Jairus went through. And you, some of you, I, I would say that probably the most thing I deal with at, at this stage of being in the ministry and the age that, that we are and the age of people in our church is dealing with uh, parents of adult children who aren't living for God. And, and, you know, as a parent, it doesn't matter how old your child gets, you're still their parent and they're still your child. Uh, it doesn't matter what age they are. And if they're not living for God, it's a burden you carry. And it's a prayer that you have on your lips and on your heart every day. And, and sometimes the children may not be grown and uh, they may still be at home. Uh, and it's not physical that you're losing them, but it may be not, they're not physically dying, but their attitude's dying. And struggle with the attitude, struggle with uh, them wanting to be obedient and wanting to listen and honor you. They have attitude disease, like I call it. And uh, you can see them beginning to go down the wrong path of life. And the dreams and the hopes you had for that child are crumbling. They're falling apart. They're not what you thought it would be. You know, it's, it, it's, it's very similar to the prodigal son. When, when the younger son said to his dad, give me what's mine. And give me my inheritance now. I'm, I'm ready to take off. I, I don't want to be here anymore. And, and I, think, I think there's an undertone there. I think it's, I don't want to work here anymore. I don't want to be under your authority. I want to be out and do my own thing. And, and the father, of course, gave the money and let him go. But you understand, as he watches that son go, he had to, he had to watch his dreams and his hopes for that young man crumble. I mean, what he, what he, what he hoped that young man would be one day and, and, and what he hoped that young man could do one day. He has to let him go and watch those dreams crumble. It's, 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 it's Calvary. It's dark. It doesn't look good. <clears throat> and and, and it's, it's interesting, though, when the son decided to go back home and, and he, he gets 
just, just on the horizon. I mean, just get to where he's in view of the house. Remember what the Bible says? Who saw him? His father saw him. Well, if his father saw him, he must have been looking for him. Something in his heart must have said, maybe today will come. Maybe, maybe every day he went out there and looked. Maybe every day he was out there wait, looking to see if he'd see somebody coming and expecting his son to come back. And of course, his father saw him afar off and, and he came back to him and, and they had a great reunion there. And, and, and you know what? I think all his dreams, all his hopes, all his plans that he had for his boy were resurrected that day. And he brought forth the robe and killed the fatted calf and they had the party. And uh, he thought, you know, it, it's never too late for God. When, when Jesus is the resurrection and the life, it's never too late for God. You say, oh no, that's dead. I, that's all gone. No, wait a minute. If it's dead, then Jesus can resurrect it. It's okay. It all depends on the, the life source of our dreams. And if, if you may have some dreams tonight and some visions for things in your life or relationships in your life or family members in your life and it seems like they're, they're gone and the life is drained out of them. But I want to encourage you tonight. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And nothing is impossible if you believe in Christ. Get a different... Jesus, did you notice as you read through this story with this little maid, this 12-year-old girl, did you notice that Jesus had a different outlook than everybody else did? I mean, here everybody else is wailing and weeping and she's dead and Jesus said, no, I think she's just asleep. Just need to wake her up. And though they, they laughed him, they laughed him to scorn. They were scorners. Thinking that no way can you do this. It's too far gone. There's nothing you can do. It all depends on what your perspective is and what the source of your vision is. Jesus knew what could happen. Jesus knew the power of God that was available to him. Sometimes when we think it's hopeless and we think it's helpless, it's because we've gotten our focus off where the power source really is and we're looking more at the problem than we are the solution to the problem. It's kind of like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember when the, the two are walking on road to Emmaus and Jesus appeared to them? It's after the resurrection now. But they didn't recognize them. Somehow there had to be a way that Jesus looked different enough that they didn't recognize who he was. And remember, they're talking along, they're sad, and Jesus said, how come you're so sad? What the, this, is not the, this is my version now, okay? I'm not quoting the scripture, okay? But the, he basically said, you know, what are you so sad today? And they said, man, haven't you heard about what's going on in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, well, I'm like, what? What's happened? Oh, Jesus of Nazareth, and, and, and we thought he was the king, and we thought he was the, the great prophet, and he was the Messiah, and, and they crucified him. And he's dead. He's gone. And, and they explained all that. And the Bible says in Luke 24. In fact, we're in Luke 8. Just, just go a few pages, will you? Look at it in Luke 24. You okay? Luke 24. Just go ahead and look there. Because this, this is a great, great story. I, I love this story on the two on the road to Emmaus. As they... As they talk, Jesus says, notice in verse 26, He says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And look what He did. Beginning at Moses, that's, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. Beginning at Moses and, and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. What a Bible study that must have been. Imagine that. So he's explaining that to them. And then they drew nigh unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were at meat, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. By the way, look at verse 32 again. 
Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now listen, and, and this is not part of the message, but I just feel like I, th- th- I should say this right here. He opens the scriptures to you. Don't, no Christian ever say, well, I just can't understand the Bible. Why not? See, have you asked him to open the scriptures to you? Huh? He'll open the scriptures. He'll open your understanding so you'll see what the scripture's talking about. Ask him to do it. But you see, they had to have their eyes open. <clears throat> and he opened their eyes and they recognized who he was. Now they saw. Now they saw not Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified three days ago. They saw the risen Son of God who's alive and who will live forevermore. They, they, their focus just went from the earthly to the eternal. The eternal Son of God. That's what our focus has to be. Resurrection Resurrection Sunday, resurrection of Jesus Christ tells us. The resurrection here of Jairus' daughter tells us God can resurrect the dreams and the vision for your family, for your loved ones, for hopes that you've had that that you think have died. Jesus can resurrect those hopes. Don't give up. Don't give up. I am the resurrection and the life. Now let's go to a second one, will we? Go to Luke chapter 7. Back again in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Notice with me verse number 11. Luke 7, 11. That's a convenient verse. <laughs> it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. He came and touched the buyer, and they that bare him stood, stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, I imagine so. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. This is a woman whose husband's already died. She's a widow. And now her only son is dead. And by the way, that's a... This is a very bleak day in this woman's life that she would have no means of support. Husband supported women, didn't work in those days, didn't have jobs, didn't, didn't bring an income. And so it was, it was her. Her husband is gone. Her son had taken up for her and I'm sure provided for her. And now he's going to be gone. And so uh, with her, with her son dying, what future does she have? What does she have to look forward to? Her only visible means of support is lying in that coffin. And she would have nothing. So I think her mourning and her sadness, her weeping here, is is for her son for sure, that she'll miss him. But it's also for herself. And her own, what's her future? She doesn't know what she's going to do. She doesn't know how she's going to live from day to day. I mean, once once the funeral's over and the people are gone and everybody goes their way, where do I go? What do I do? How am I gonna, what am I going to eat tomorrow? What am I hearing? You got something on? Okay. Just, just hit that button and hold it down until it goes blank. And then it will be off. Okay. Thank you. So this widow, for her, in her mind, her future relied on her son being alive. But he's not. You think about that? What are you what are you relying on for your future? What do you require to remain alive or for your future to exist? You you think about that in your mind. And then think about what if that's taken away? How would I react? 
If that thing was to die and your future was to vanish, what would you do? David in the Old Testament had his future prophesied over him when Samuel anointed him to be king. He knew that he was to be the next king in Israel. But time and time again in his life, that didn't look like that was going to happen. He's running from Saul. He's hunted like a fugitive, really like a wild animal. There were times, I'm sure, that he thought, how is this ever going to come to pass? But he wrote in Psalm 31 that he said, Lord, my times are in your hands. I'm not in control of this. You're in control of this. It's really interesting that Jesus here touched the coffin that this young man was in. And hands on to the one thing that she needed to secure her future. I think Jesus was trying to remind her, uh, widow lady, your future isn't in the hands of your son. Your future isn't in the hands, and by the way, your future isn't in the hands of the government. Your future isn't in the hands of your pension or your 401k or your, your, your retirement plan. Your future is in the hand of God. Your future is in the hand of God. It is your time's are in His hands. doesn't matter. Don't, don't, don't rely on social insecurity. And don't rely on retirement accounts. Don't rely on the pension plans. Don't rely on the job you have. Our future's in the hands of Jesus Christ. I don't know the future, but I know the one who holds the future. Amen? Look at, go back to the Old Testament for a moment to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, familiar passage here to us. Isaiah 53, about the crucifixion of Christ. But you notice how the passage starts? It starts in verse 1 by saying, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I mean, who, who's going to believe this? Because what's he say? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, has a root out of a dry ground. He hath no former comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty. We should desire him. Did you notice it just said that he's going to grow up as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground? Let me ask you a question. How does a plant grow in dry ground? Not very well, does it? <laughs> so the thing... Start ground is cracking and dry. Sterile ground, ground with no life-giving properties. It's not going to grow very well at all. Jesus, Jesus then, listen, listen now, Jesus is our example. And He grew, not because He had the right environment, not because He had everything, the, the, the right education and the right cultural conditions, he didn't have everything in place that would make that soil just beautiful and rich and, and, and nut nutritional, so boy, he'd just spring up. No, he didn't have any of that. He was in Nazareth. He was on the wrong side of the tracks. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And that, that was the answer. No, man, nothing good comes out of there. That's the scum of the earth there. There weren't any, I think, I think it was Pastor Kingsbury talking about it, saying, you know, there weren't any good neighborhoods in Nazareth. He didn't say, well, yeah, he lives in Nazareth, but you know, he lives in the good part. There wasn't any good part. That was Nazareth. So it's not, it's not, listen, his future, why did he thrive? Why did he grow up? Why was he able to, to, to be that tender plant and grow up strong? He grew up because the hand of God was on his life. Because God took care of him. How will you grow? What's your future going to be? Whether you're, whether you're 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. What's your future? I don't know what your future is, but I know this. Your future, my future, is in the hand of God. That's who I'm relying on. That's who I'm counting on. It's got to be the hand of God. 
Jeremiah chapter 18. If you go to the right from Isaiah, you'll, you should find Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18, God gives Jeremiah a visual lesson to teach the children of Israel. He tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. Look in Jeremiah 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so that he made it again another vessel, has seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. You know what God's saying? God's saying, you may, you may have a future that you think is messed up. You may, have, you may uh, have some plans that you had laid out, and you know what? They've been destroyed. You say, now what are we going to do? Now what's going to happen? You know what God says? Just, just, just put yourself on the potter's wheel. Let me make you into another vessel. Just yield yourself to me. And, and you know what? God can, God can bring a resurrection about. He can resurrect your future and give you a different future than what you ever thought you'd be doing. Never thought. I'll guarantee you, at, at uh, how old is Ron Mortimer? 43. I guarantee you, 43, he never saw himself being a foreign missionary. He didn't. It, you'd ask him when he was 20 years old, 21 years old, 22 years old, what do you see yourself doing in 20 years? I guarantee you he wouldn't say. I'll, it'll be where he is. Hmm? What happened? God resurrected a different future, didn't he? What he did was to keep himself on the potter's wheel. You don't know. You don't know. I don't know where you'll be 10 years from now. I don't know where you'll be 15 years from now. 20 years from now. I don't know what God has in mind or what God's future will be, but I know this, it, 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 he, can, he can start again and remake a vessel any way he wants. And he can give you a brand new ending. But you have to remain in his hand. Let him direct you. Let him shape you. Let your future be in his hand, not your hand. If you've entrusted your soul to him, can't you entrust your life to him? Can you entrust your finances to him? Hmm? Let him be your provider. So I think uh, we have the resurrection of uh, a dream for your family, resurrection of your future, and then where we started this evening in John chapter 11, of course, the resurrection of Lazarus uh, when he comes and Mary and Martha meet him. John 11, where we read this evening. John 11. Another great, great passage. Jesus had heard Mary and Martha's request for him to come and to be with them. But you notice, he didn't come when they wanted him to come. He didn't come in their time, he came in his time. Ever had God do that to you? <laughs> didn't come when you thought he should come, but he came in his time. And, and the issue is always faith. Trusting God. Jesus when they didn't when he didn't come right away they thought he didn't answer their prayer i made that statement and i think so often that's where we got that idea that why well, when you pray god will say yes no or wait you're hard pressed in the bible where god told somebody no you're hard pressed to find that now he let paul have a thorn in the flesh and he told paul why so the power of christ will rest upon you and then what did paul say that's what I want. Huh, that's what I want. I'd rather have that that the power of Christ rest upon me. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know why we think no? Because when God doesn't answer when we think He should answer, we stop praying. We stop praying. And we think He didn't answer. Did God answer their prayer? Did, did Jesus answer their prayer to come? 
Yes, he did. He just didn't come when they said he would come. And so, and by the way, when he didn't come when they said to come, you know what they did? They lost faith. What did Martha say? Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Who's she blaming for Lazarus' death? Jesus. Mary comes out. Mary says the identical thing. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, the Scripture doesn't say it, but I, I, knowing people, like we know people, I would think that probably the friends and the mourners that are there probably said the same thing to them. Where was Jesus? I thought He was your friend. I thought You called for Him, didn't you? How come He didn't come? I thought He said He loved you guys. And there are people around you sometimes that say, I, man, I thought, I thought Jesus loved you. If Jesus loved you so much, how come you went through that? If Jesus loved you so much, how come this happened to you? How come that happened to you? And, and I'm sure they heard that, and so they, they thought, how come, how come Jesus didn't keep Lazarus from dying? And it's interesting, Jesus comes and has to let them know that He's the resurrection and the life. And notice, I love her response. Look at verse 25, which we read earlier about Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though we're dead, yet shall he live. Now look, verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now she's got it. She says, oh, now I know who you are. You're the Son of God. You're, you're the one who should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went and got Mary, her sister. And, of course, she came. And, of course, she said the same thing. And Jesus, he said, Where have you laid him? In verse number 34. And they said, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, Behold how he loved him. And then notice, some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? And Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. And Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast hurt me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. I'm going to help their faith by praying out loud. When he had thus said, when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth!" When he, when the, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said to them, "Loose him and let him go." And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. So, Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. He stands before that tomb, calls out Lazarus' name, and Lazarus comes out. Lazarus is alive. Jesus brings him back from the dead. Faith. Faith says, I believe you're the Son of God. Faith says, I believe you can do anything. Faith says, nothing's impossible with God. Faith says, I'll move the stone away. Faith says, I believe you can bring him back from the dead. Faith says, I believe you are the resurrection and the life. Resurrect the, the, the broken dreams and resurrect my family and resurrect my relationships and resurrect my faith in you. I know. Jesus may not have come through like you wanted him to, but he's still the I am. Your family member may not have been healed like you wanted him to. Maybe, maybe you healed him by taking him to heaven, but Jesus is still the I am. The bill may be overdue and the money hasn't come in, but Jesus is still the I Am. That person may still get on your nerves and God hasn't changed them, but He's still the I Am. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For you who comes to God must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith. How much God wants to use us in our lives, but, but, he, but He wants to operate and He blesses and He wants to honor our faith in Him. 
Not in what we see, but what we don't see. Faith in God. So many people you talk to lose their faith in God because He didn't come through when they wanted Him to. How they wanted Him to. I say faith was not founded right if that's your case. It's based on what God could do for you rather than what God could be for you. I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection Sunday says you must trust Him. You must have faith in Him. You must believe in Him. And I'll tell you something, but your life is never too messed up. Your life is never too far gone for God to do something in your life. It's never too late. I read the prayer letter Brother Jarvis put out talking about their language school. And he's asking who that scoundrel was that said you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> he said that is old dogs learning a new language. <laughs> and he's, he's asking for prayer, but he says, you know what? It, uh, it, it, and by the way, that's a false statement. An old dog, you can't teach an old dog, no. You can't teach a dead dog new tricks, but you can teach an old dog new tricks. And uh, you, can, you can always, always learning. Always wanting to know and, and, and praise the Lord. By the way, they're coming home Thursday, uh, April 20. And uh, they're home for just a little while. Then they go back, I think in May sometime, for three months. they got another grandbaby coming. I think uh, Krista up in Michigan is due April 27th. So they're coming home for the birth of the grandchild. And then May they head back for three more months, I believe. They'll come back for the missions conference in September at, at Milford. And then he's not sure after that what's going to happen. But... You know, don't ever think it's too late. I thought about the thief on the cross as we observe the Lord's table. If anybody ever thought it was too late for them, it could have been that guy. Amen. Convicted and, and guilty, rightfully so. The one fella is, and, and, and seemingly whether they knew each other or not, we don't know. They could have. But as that fella is, is cursing and and blaspheming and saying things against the Son of God, that fellow kind of says, why don't you be quiet? That man's done nothing wrong. And notice, you know, and, and listen, it's easy for us with the Bible to look at that. When, you, when We didn't read far enough in Isaiah, but it says, you know, on the cross, it, that Jesus had no form or comeliness. We would desire him. In fact, there's a passage there in Isaiah that says, he was so marred and so beaten that you couldn't even tell that was a human being on the cross. No, there, there, there's, there is no way visually that you could get a picture of that. And you and I could understand that. And this man is looking at that hanging on a cross. And he says, Lord, remember me when, not if, when you come into your kingdom. There's no doubt in his mind that was the Lord and he's going to be a king. He has a kingdom. That's, that's amazing faith that fellow had. And that's why Jesus would tell him today, you'll be with me in paradise. And I wonder how rejoicing that fellow was thinking, hey, it's not too late. I mean, it's the last hour for sure. It's the last few minutes for sure. But it's never too late for God to change somebody's life. Don't ever give up on anybody. We spent the, the week at Rockford and, you know, hearing the testimonies and, you know, what, you, what comes through every year when, when we go and we hear those testimonies is you don't, 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 don't give up on anybody. God can change anyone. And, and it, may not, it may not be the first time. One, one little girl there, little girl, one young woman, gave her testimony there that it was her, it was her third time back at the Ruth house. She'd been there two other times and either had left and, and didn't, didn't finish or whatever it was, but now it's the third time, and you know what? She's got it. Now, now the Lord has gotten through. But you know why? Because you don't give up. You don't give up. Don't write people off. Don't do that. Just, just continue to pray for them and ask God to intervene. Listen, you're not the resurrection in the life. I'm not the resurrection in the life. Okay? Jesus is the resurrection in life. So what do you do? Point people to Jesus. 
Point people to Jesus. Let him be the resurrection and the life. Resurrection Sunday, our assurance that it's never too late for God. It's never too late for God. He's the resurrection for our family, for our future, and for our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now tonight. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention this evening. Lord, thank you for the resurrection power. Thank you, Lord. Remind us that the resurrection is not an event, though it is an event. It's more than an event. It's a person. You are the resurrection and the life. And Father, tonight I'm, I'm praying for people in the room who have family members. They have, they have children. They have relationships that, Lord, are... They've gone the way of the prodigal son. Maybe they're, they feel like they are at the point of death like Jairus' daughter was. Not, not just physically, Lord, but attitude-wise, relationship-wise. Lord, may we trust you to be the resurrection and the life for our family. May we trust you, Lord, to be the resurrection and the life concerning our futures. May we all be willing to say our times are in your hands, Lord. May, may each of us trust you for our future. Not what we have, not what we've done, not the plans we've made, but we trust you. And our faith is in you. Resurrect that faith. Some tonight, Lord, are wavering in their faith because... You didn't come through when they thought you should. Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us to have faith in who you are, not just what you do. Lord, we, you are the resurrection life. You're the great I am. And that it's never too late for you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'll finish praying here in just a moment wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart tonight. I, I need to focus on I am the resurrection. Maybe a family situation. Maybe your future in your own life. And what, what do you see the way forward from here? You've been trying to figure it out instead of just saying, God, I'm trusting you. My faith is in you. Maybe you've been struggling with your own faith. Because God hasn't done some things when you thought he should have done it. You say, I need to, God to strengthen my faith tonight that he is the great I am. If God has ministered to your heart tonight, the Spirit of God has pricked your heart, would you say, Pastor, pray for me this evening? Would you slip your hand up? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? Do what God's bidding you to do. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. We bow before you now in these next few moments. Increase our faith, Lord. We're like the, the fellow in the Bible who said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, focus our attention on Jesus Christ. For he is the resurrection and the life. I'll thank you for that. With your heads bowed, would you stand to your feet? As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she begins to play, Bob will sing. God has spoken to your heart. Obey him this evening. Respond to his talk, will you please? All to Jesus I surrender. That's right. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, 
worldly pleasures all forsaken take me jesus take me now i surrender all i surrender all all to thee my blessed jesus I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessing. Father, we thank you now for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for a, a wonderful Lord's Day together. It's wonderful that we have a risen Savior. It's wonderful, Lord, that every Sunday can be Resurrection Sunday for us. Every Sunday we celebrate that he arose on the first day of the week. And, Lord, I pray that we'll allow him to live through us this week that others will see Christ in our life, that we'll see him at work in our life. Lord, that as we face situations and we uh, face situations with family members, our future and our own faith, that we'll keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, that he'll perfect the work that you desire in each one of us. We love you. Thank you for a wonderful Lord's Day together. Dismiss us now with your care. Lord, make us mindful of your presence with us. Lord, I pray we'll be about your business this week. And may we influence people in the world you've given to us for the cause of Christ and point them to the Savior. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it, all right? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.